class on the inside of the text, but we call it class. Um, they can point to the right direction. And let's start with our first conference, which Ivan just, it's landing right now. Hope so. Yeah, from Dallas. Um, sometimes security, there are some things that we cannot control, and we'd rather people be safe, and airlines do take safety very seriously. So as long as he's here, we're, we're, we're happy. Um, he might be here at the end of the conference. So, so, yeah. But Devin has been appointed to I'm prepared please. to step in, yeah. Yes. So it's the first conference, Family Enterprise Rest Alliance in Emerging and Frontier Markets and Evolving Research Program. Um, not that he needs an introduction because he already sp sp spoke uh, yesterday, but Devin specializes in financial, operational, and strategic aspects of family enterprise. He holds a master's from the Kennedy School at Harvard with, with a focus in finance and economics, as well as a bachelor in business administration from York University. He has worked in, with private and public sector leaders throughout the Americas, Europe, and the Middle East in Asia, and Asia, and teaches about family enterprise at Harvard, Kellogg, and Yale. His work with family enterprises focuses on continuity, planning, governance, design, design analysis of firm performance, and enterprise risk, shareholder education and development, and strategic sustainability initiatives. He's also leading the global research project out of Kellogg on the rest lines of family firms in emerging and emerging and frontier markets. And it is an honor for Universidad Panamericana and for FERC to have you here, Devin. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, everybody. In, in true fashion, we're, we're adapting on the fly here to the reality that Yvonne was supposed to be in last night, but his flight got canceled and he's flying in this morning, but it got delayed. And so at some point in the next couple of hours, he will make an appearance here on campus. Hopefully it's before the end of this session. Uh, if not, you'll get a chance to interact with him. And I, I hope that I'm able to carry the conversation in the meantime, in his absence, he's here with us, of, of course, in spirit. Um, in the next 90 or so minutes, maybe 80 or so minutes, now we're starting a little bit late, but these are the main things that we want to cover. Uh, we want to talk about the origins of this research. Some of you may be familiar with it. You may have heard us speak at, at FFI or at AOM uh, in the past, uh, but we'll bring everybody up to speed on, on the origins, why this is important to us and why we think it's important research to advance, how we got to where we are, uh, where we are right now in terms of the evolution of our hypotheses, and ultimately want to share the conceptual model inspired by the session yesterday with boxes and arrows and all sorts of uh, uh, interrelated uh, um, sort of understanding of, all of how all these moving parts fit together. And then we'll talk a little bit about next steps at the end. Uh, but briefly, if Yvonne were here, this would be easier. I will try to do it in his stead. Um, our backgrounds, uh, we like to consider as we reflect on this project to be broadly complementary. Uh, that my background in finance and economics and, and with a sort of a, uh, um, a preference for thinking about macro and institutionally sort of top down at this issue and Yvonne has a very much a, a social psychology org behavior and a distributive justice background. He likes to think about this from the organizational perspective up and so these two perspectives uh, we found to be pretty complementary as we think about this and the, and the gaps in our perspective are very very well complemented but we do obviously share a curiosity about how families in these very complicated environments not only survive but actually thrive. And in addition to that, how they are, are incredible sponsors of economic development in these environments. So it's a, it's a passion project for us, as well as one that we think might, uh, might uh, produce some uh, useful insights, not only for, uh, for academics, but also for practitioners. To give you a little bit about the context about how we got here, uh, a number of years ago, I received this email from a close friend. It was an article that was published about a shooting in Caracas, in downtown Caracas. And a businessman stepped off an airplane, he got into an armored car, he drove into the heart of Caracas in downtown Venezuela, got out of the car, walked into the foyer of this hotel, and was gunned down by two armed assailants on a motorcycle who took his briefcase and sped off down the driveway and that was it. Um, and so to anybody who's been tracking the slow motion train wreck that is modern Venezuela, it wouldn't come as a particular surprise that there are murders happening openly in the streets. After all, in that same year, there were 24,000 murders uh, 
in the city of Caracas, that's more than Baghdad, made it the murder capital of the world. To put that in context, in major U.S. cities of a similar size, there were between you know, 100 and 600 murders in that same year. So you know, orders of magnitude bigger. Uh, but what was particularly important for me in, in reading through the article was recognizing that I'd stayed at that same hotel several times in the previous year and once only months before. And so, you know, ranging from the mundane questions that are immediately rush in, in in the wake of something like this, a realization like, you know, I need to obviously find a new hotel to stay at when I'm in Caracas, and what am I going to tell my wife? I promised her this place was safe, all the way through to the sublime, which is that, that in reflecting on our clients and the fact that they have to interact and live in this environment on a daily basis, you know, how is it that they're able to do it? How is it that they're able to deal with not only persistent security risks, but persistent uh, political instability, economic instability, social instability, and, and, and continue to, to, to produce uh, and, and to employ thousands of people, produce goods that are vital in a society that is so, uh, is so uh, starved of key goods and key necessities like diapers and batteries and medicines and so forth. Um, and so it prompted a broader reflection. One is that obviously there are parts of the world where this isn't a, a, an acute uh, a sort of episodic risk, but in fact it is a chronic risk. It's a risk that persists over decades in some cases. So whether it's a family-controlled bank that's investing in lending in, in, uh, in Lebanon uh, over the last several decades, or if it's a pharmaceutical company in Venezuela who's uh, providing vital, me vital medical goods, uh, if it's uh, an insurance company operating in Nigeria and managing and helping other companies hedge against all sorts of risks, or if it's a, a hotel operator in, in Haiti that seems to be the, you know, sort of the epicenter of virtually every natural disaster possible in the Caribbean. Uh, there, clearly, there are groups of family, uh, enterprising families who have found a way to not only operate effectively and continue to operate in these environments, but are doing so incredibly successfully. And, and we wanted to learn was, whether there was something that, that all of them are doing collectively or pockets of them were doing that could be generalizable, that we could share with others that would be useful uh, uh, across a, a, a vast range of potential uh, use cases. And so, when we talk about extreme environments, we then, begot, we, we then began to get a little curious. We said, well, is there, is there something worth pursuing more broadly when we understand that emerging markets are, on the one hand, going to be the, the, the greatest source of, of wealth creation and economic uh, uh, activity over the, uh, the next uh, quarter century at least, um, if this trend continues, this is the emerging markets here and their share of glo global GDP, you could see at some point, in, in, in the late aughts, the, early, uh, the last 10 years or so, that economic activity in the emerging world has eclipsed the activity in, uh, in the developed world. There's all sorts of reasons for that, demographics and so forth. But clearly, growth rates in the emerging world are much higher. And at the same time, in precisely those regions, that is where family businesses are disproportionately represented. And so you've got the combination of these two factors, that most of the growth in the world economy will take place in these environments, and this is precisely where family businesses uh, uh, have, a, have a substantial influence over all of that economic activity, it suggests that we're, we're, we're tapping a rich vein here and one that we wanted to pursue in, in greater detail. Out of curiosity in this room of, of scholars, any, any uh, hypotheses as to why China and Africa are the outliers here? Reporting? Reporting? Um, Possibly, but that's that's not what's what's tapped as being responsible for that, at least in the in the literature. Any other guesses? So, among all the emerging markets, these are two areas, two regions in particular, where state-owned enterprises have uh, a pretty dominant influence, and so uh, they they fill the gap that otherwise uh, non-family-controlled private enterprise and family-controlled private enterprise wouldn't otherwise, in the sort of commanding heights of those economies. So, building on existing scholarship, we have a sense that there's something worth pursuing in exploring family business activity in emerging markets. And we have a sense that they do things differently there, if for no other reason than because the circumstances within which they are embedded are fundamentally different. So they've got all the challenges of operating a business and all these extra things that they have to manage at the same time, like people getting gunned down in hotels in their backyard. And so we recognize that there are, uh, there's plenty of conventional focus on the three-circle dynamics and resilience to traditional family business risks around succession, around leadership transition, around estate planning, and so forth. Uh, but we did identify, and we, when we were doing our lit review, that there was limited research on family businesses in emerging markets, period, as well as, in particular, uh, how families respond to extreme environmental risks. 
And so we felt like this is an area where we were curious and where we could add value and, and, and where we had energy to continue to produce, pursue some research. And in our early digestion of this, at least looking at our own client base, we recognize that there are clusters of risks that families in these environments face that, that uh, families who don't operate in these uh, environments might not otherwise face. The threat of expropriation, not a big risk in the U.S. Change in tax regimes, well, maybe possibly, but more favorably in the U.S. than in other places where it tends to be more about transparency and increasing accountability for private enterprise. Valuations, divergent risk appetite, access to capital, and so forth. There's a whole cluster of risks. That's just in ownership. In family, we talked about personal security already. There's disengagement. There's moral ambiguity of dealing with uh, the kind of rampant corruption that often exists in these kinds of environments. And then there are all sorts of business risks as well access to human capital, access to physical capital in some cases, being able to import key goods to continue to grow and scale your enterprise can be difficult if you can't get hard currency to pay for those goods and services and so forth. Uh, there tends to be very poor infrastructure, often to the point where families themselves are building out that infrastructure, and we'll talk about that in a moment as well, as well as, uh, of course, uh, the regulatory environments that are constantly shifting and the, and the graph that seems to be pervasive in these environments. So then we had to ask, the ask ourselves the question, well, what qualifies as extreme? I and mean, where are we going to draw the line? At some point, is it all countries but the US, Canada, and a couple Western European nations? Or are we going to just target the OECD countries and anything outside of that is fair game? There, it turns out there are many different ways of slicing and dicing the global map and, and determining where, uh, where countries would fit in terms of their level of development. Um, one of the ones that we've used, and there are many maps like this, uh, but the World Bank produces several of them. And you can use the political stability and absence of violence indicator from the World Bank. You can use the World Economic Forum's competitiveness indices uh, that compare that across all major uh, uh, countries in the world. You can look at Transparency International. Uh, there's all sorts of these things. But at the end of the day, we have to recognize that this map will constantly evolve. You know, just recently, Colombia was elected into the OECD, and yet we would consider them a, 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 a critical uh, market in which we would want to explore the dynamics because it's, it's, it's in many ways very different from, you know, operating in France if you're operating in Colombia. And so you know, the OECD characteristic wasn't, wasn't uh, descriptive enough, wasn't clear enough for us. So what we suggested was we have to recognize that extremity is going to change over time. And so we need something that adapts to that changing definition. And, uh, and, and it helped us to reflect on the fact that all developed markets at some point were emerging markets. If we recognize that you go back in time, there's a, a, a piece of art of the Battle of Borodino, it's Napoleon marching uh, in, uh, toward Russia, but there were plenty of family controlled companies that were alive and kicking at the time and have survived and thrived since. And you can look at uh, sort of Germany's experience with hyperinflation that parallels in many ways what uh, places like Venezuela and Zimbabwe have gone through in recent years with thousands of percent inflation on an annual basis. And yet there are family controlled companies that have survived through those episodes. And similarly, in the US during the Great Depression, there were plenty of big companies that were actually forged in the fires of that or, or in some cases survived and endured having operated before, grappling with the tensions that existed during and then ultimately uh, were able to th thrive in the wake of that. And so we want to make sure that, that we recognize that we're not trying to, to, to segment certain countries and, and, and avoid others. What we're looking for are conditions that are particularly complex, and we're trying to glean insights from how families adapted with those complex conditions, whether they are current or historical. Um, and as we reflected then on the conventional understanding of family business, it turns out that, that uh, resilience is in fact baked into the DNA of family enterprise. If you think about some of the things that we highlight as being sort of germane uh, and, and, a, and a fundamental part of how families think about uh, their, their entrepreneurship, that they tend to have a deep connection to a city, a country, or a region, the place in which the family grew up, and that's where they built their first headquarters, and they may even have a museum there now as a testament to their, uh, their connection to this place. Uh, and that tends to make them less likely to move in the case of you know, a, multi a multinational that enters a country and sees uh, a bunch of risk coming their way, a change in regime or, uh, or a war spilling over from a neighboring country. They're more inclined to, to turn tail and run than a family controlled company that was, that was born and raised in, in that environment. Similarly, bias toward longer term investment allows them to ride out some of these tumultuous episodes, even the longer ones. Uh, being frugal in good times and bad tends to uh, buffet the, uh, the uh, balance sheet against the kinds of uh, capital, uh, cap access to capital issues that tend to exist and take place in these extreme environments, particularly in undeveloped markets where, where financial markets aren't, aren't particularly effective. Um, they tend to excel at retaining talent. We, if you sort of search for 
the longevity of the, uh, the amount of time that the average employee, uh, in terms of loyalty, remains with the company. The average tenure, it's much higher in a family-controlled company than otherwise, and that cuts both ways, of course, but it's, it's something that in markets where labor, uh, in labor markets that are underdeveloped, it's actually an asset, and so forth. Concentrated ownership allows for quick uh, decision-making, and in these contexts, of course, when you have to make decisions quickly because there's, uh, there are armed gunmen outside the front gates of your manufacturing facility, you, need to, you can't co convene a board of directors in another country and have them you know, sort of weigh in on what we have to do next. You have to have boots on the ground that are able to respond quickly to these kinds of acute uh, traumas. And so with all of this in mind, with all this context in mind, Yvonne and I set out to, to be a little more deliberate about how we were thinking about this. At first it was just sort of a, a patchwork of conversations that we were having and, and work directly with clients who were operating in these environments, but we realized that maybe there was something worth investing in more uh, systematically and so we came up with this this research design and I'm sure there would be challenges to this and we'd be happy to take uh, constructive criticism but in general it's a pretty simple process where we wanted to start by first gathering a public data set something that could be validated by others uh, um, basically looking at the markets that we identified as extreme in the way that we just described finding the largest companies that have existed for the longest amount of time within those markets, and then just getting basic characteristics, statistical characteristics about them, how big they are, how many employees they have, what their revenues are, and so forth, uh, what generation is in control. Um, and then we, uh, we analyzed that public data, and we came up with a couple of initial hypotheses, which we'll share with you in a moment. Um, then we moved into sort of research design based on, on those uh, hypotheses, and we and we ended up conducting some semi-structured interviews. We then refined those hypotheses, and here we are in the mid middle of it right now. We'll share a conceptual model. We're about to launch a global survey to test some of these hypotheses, and again, we'd love your feedback on that toward the end. And ultimately, we're gonna analyze those results and share them with all of you and, and, and our clients and, and the rest of the world, anybody who's interested in it at that point. Um, so we're very excited that we're sort of nearing the end of this, but we did get started a number of years ago now, and, uh, and because it's not a full-time, uh, gig for us in terms of doing our research. It has taken longer, but we're hopeful that that means that we're being deliberate about it. And, uh, and Dita has been really great at, at keeping us, uh, keeping us uh, honest about our commitment to, to advancing. And at the tail end, I think you see a book in there somewhere, which maybe there will be, but we'll see when we get there. Um, in terms of our initial data set, uh, we gathered uh, the, the, the profiles of 150, well, it's a little more than 150 family-controlled companies in uh, mostly extreme markets. We did look at some developed markets and companies that have been around for hundreds of years in those markets. So we looked at places like Japan and Germany and France and so forth. So we've got some 800 year old temple builders and things of that nature in the data set uh, because we thought it was relevant and that they'd endured all sorts of trauma over that time. Um, uh, there's geographic representation. We got 28 countries, anywhere from the second to the 19th generation, anywhere from 50 million in revenues up to 330 billion in the case of the Samsungs of the world and anywhere from 150 million to over a million employees in the case of the Foxconns of the world. And based on that initial cut of data, based on that, that data set, we began to tease out a couple of early constructs that we felt would be useful and we've since moved on from and our thinking has evolved, but I wanted to share a couple of uh, early case studies which we thought were emblematic of the types of, of, of problem solving that these families go through in these markets and that we saw consistently across several systems. So we thought there maybe there was a uh, a cluster or buckets of activity or bust, uh, buckets of decision making that uh, that were um, that were that suggested a durability in terms of uh, in terms of these organizations and one of the ones that we really love is uh, the Añanos family. It's very difficult for non-Spanish speakers to pronounce Añanos with two of the Enyas in the in the word. But anyhow, they are uh, uh, they are the developers of Cola Real uh, and they began their uh, their entrepreneurial journey in the late 1980s the time in which the Shining Path Rebels were very active in Peru. And so the part of the country where they were living, delivery trucks literally could not get into, uh, into the towns and villages uh, where them and their families lived because of the mercenaries who were blocking roads and access. So what they ended up doing was taking a bunch of their, uh, their kitchen equipment and recycled beer bottles and they began to brew their own cola. And they began to give it and sell it to friends and neighbors, and ultimately they began to sell it to neighboring villages and ultimately to neighboring regions. And then they became the leading seller of the lower end uh, cola in the Peruvian market. And then they expanded across several uh, emerging markets. They're in Ecuador, Central America, Brazil, Colombia. And then they jumped across the Pacific and they started investing in Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, and even India. And now they've got, as you can see here, over a billion and a half dollars worth of sales every year. 
and this was all based on, an, uh, on, a, on a concept of replacing something that was otherwise available in their market but was taken away due to political and social strife. Uh, and so this is, you get a sense that, that this kind of entrepreneurship, this kind of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of emergent entrepreneurship that comes from necessity is, is one that we've actually seen play out time and time again across various cultures, not just in Latin America, but in the Middle East uh, and, and the Far East as well as Africa. So another case we want to share with you is the Balbaki family, uh, a fascinating case, a family based out of Syria. And the, their entrepreneurial journey began in the late 1800s uh, with a single textiles plant. And so they're making, making textiles, making fabrics. Uh, eventually, the sons, when they entered the business, they moved downstream and established a department store. So they would begin to make and sell other people's products as well as their own in the department stores. And then from retail, they, they began to pivot into other areas of manufacturing. And uh, in 1957, they established one of the first fa uh, factories of white goods. Of, uh, of appliances and steel furniture in Syria. And then it all came to a roaring halt in 1964 when them and virtually every other private company in Syria was nationalized. Uh, and so they pivoted, they all left, uh, went to Lebanon and, uh, and reestablished themselves without the uh, benefit of a lot of the capital which they'd had in Syria, but some nest egg that they'd built outside of the country. Uh, and they moved to Beirut and they founded a marketing firm. So they said, we've got a lot of know-how, but we no longer have the physical capital, we have the intellectual capital. So let's start advising others who are uh, interested in entering this space. And they began again and they built themselves back up from scratch and they got into more diversified activities. They moved into real estate and financial services and so forth. But I thought this quote in particular from Hassan Balbaki, uh, who's a really interesting guy who I got to meet last year at a conference in Oman, um, and, and I want to read it to you here because I think it will resonate with this crowd in particular. But during the fast, past 50 years, we've survived and prospered despite experiencing nationalization in Syria, civil war and devaluation in Lebanon, regime changes in markets where we were active, as well as the equally dangerous transition from generation to generation in our management and ownership. So here's somebody who gets the sense that all of the conventional family business risks that these systems face are present in their world, and yet they have to deal with all of this other stuff too. So that gives you just a, a brief snapshot of the kind of struggle, the kind of, uh, the kind of risks that, that need to be overcome in some of these markets, and yet there are people out there doing it. So this energized us when we, when we hear stories of success like this, and it made us want to dive in more. It made us want to interview these families, and, and we have had a chance to interview them and several others in these, in these conditions. So as we're developing our initial hypotheses before we got to the interview phase, we wanted to reflect on the cases that we had, uh, that we had developed. And, uh, and pulled together. And there were three key insights that came from, from that review. The first was that emerging markets are clearly categorically different in the way in which the institutional context frames the activities of the enterprise itself. And so in general, there are thing, you know, is, you know, um, characteristics like a lower trust in third parties. So if we don't know the person, we're less likely to want to do business with them. And so there's all sorts of issues around uh, reputation and credibility there that the capital markets tend to be illiquid, so access to capital as well as exit from your family enterprise tends to be more challenging, which may also help to explain some of the, the higher representativeness of family enterprise in, in these environments, uh, that there tend to be high barriers to entry, that other, uh, other firms and other, uh, multinationals might not necessarily want to invest in places that are this complex. They may want to stay in places that are more predictable, where the regulatory environments and the political environments are more stable and where they can make long-term investments and expect to get returns on those investments over time. Uh, where there's unreliable infrastructure, and that goes, uh, it's soft and hard infrastructure combined. It isn't just roads and telecoms and bridges and so forth, but it's also uh, some of the connective tissue in society. It's you know, schools and hospitals and things of that nature that help support uh, the labor markets and so forth. The government tends to be dysfunctional, at least on, on the spectrum of dysfunction, and that there tends to be systemic corruption. Uh, and then, and, you know, it, without any value judgment there, that that's just the way in which business gets done. That if you want to accelerate, uh, you know, the, the, the permits for a new a manufacturing facility and you don't want to wait 18 months for that to clear, then you pay the bribe. And, uh, and it's just a transactional cost of doing business in these markets. And, and so we'll come back to the sense of what that means in terms of, 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 of the values implications, and particularly as next gen age into an awareness of the, the actions of their parents and, uh, and have to grapple with the fact that their family wealth has been built on a set of activities that when they go away to, to school in the US and they attend uh, you know, sort of an Ivy League MBA and they go back home and they, and they re uh, reintegrate with their family companies ends up creating some tension, as you can imagine. Uh, 
So our second uh, insight is that biological resilience may in fact uh, give us some clarity or some insight into organizational resilience. And by show of hands, has anybody seen a picture like this before? Do you guys know the tardigrade? Have you, have you met this little creature before? There are some. I mean, it's four years ago, this was a more novel concept, but uh, since then, they've, they've, uh, they've been, um, they've been uh, celebrated for their unbelievable resilience. This is a tiny microscopic creature that exists virtually everywhere on our planet. It can, exist, it can uh, survive on the tops of mountains, the bottoms of oceans, in the, in the vacuum of outer space. Uh, it can desiccate for up to, I think they've done tests now, they, it was previously 10 years, but it's now up to 30 years uh, without any nutrients or water. And then with a little bit of water, they can rehydrate, reanimate, and begin procreating again. So this is one of the most resilient creatures on the planet, and scientists are obviously studying these things now to figure out whether or not there are any applications to manufacturing or pharmaceuticals and so forth. And, and we wonder, and there is a, a body of researchers who are now exploring the, 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 um, the, the utility of, of, of the types of solutions that biologically that nature has created to some of these existential problems and whether or not there are similar analogs in, in the organizational world. And there are some issues with that we'll talk about in a moment. The third set of uh, insights that we had was that there, are five, there tended to be in our data set, at least our first data set, five recurring archetypes. So those cases that we shared were two examples of those archetypes. The first one, scavengers are sort of grounded in the economic literature around scavenging uh, economics and making use of what you have around you to be entrepreneurial. And then the Balbaki family would be an example of what we were calling chameleons. People are uh, rapidly able to adapt and change based on uh, changing circumstances. So they can always fit in uh, depending on, uh, on how the context changes, as it does rapidly in these environments. So these are our first three insights. These are the first ones that we had shared with, uh, with the audiences at our first FFI presentation in 2014. And at that point, we got a bunch of great feedback, and we decided it was time to go out and, and gather some, some hard data from, from a series of semi-structured interviews. Our key questions, the key questions we were trying to ask as we were going into these interviews were how do family enterprises survive in extreme environments? What accounts for their resiliency and their adaptive capacity? And are there lessons, of course, for family companies operating in all environments? Is there something that we can translate that, that is useful for all family companies that we can learn from families who are operating on the frontiers of, of uh, the modern global economy? In terms of geographic focus, we have five key clusters that we are focusing on. We were looking for a minimum of 25 years and some multi-generational control or leadership. Uh, we didn't want to set it any uh, any longer than that because then you miss out on some of the countries that have only recently embraced capitalism and so there you know countries like China where there really isn't a lot of economic activity uh, on the mainland up until uh, the late 80s early 90s uh, you know we, we'd miss entirely from the data set if we if we set it any longer than that but uh, the preference of course in, in markets that have had uh, robust private uh, enterprise for for hundreds of hundreds of years ideally we have the sort of the longer lived firms in those systems and we want to get a sense of what they've done to manage multiple succession journeys and multiple episodes of, of volatility in politics uh, and the political sphere, economics and so forth. Um, our sources of data will include the public data set, will include our qualitative interviews. Uh, we're about to launch uh, um, a quantitative survey uh, targeted at C-suite and above. It's going to be global. Hopefully we're going to have uh, plenty of respondents and we're working actively on the design of that. We've been presenting at conferences and gathering feedback. We've held panels, campus roundtables among students of, uh, f within family enterprises who, uh, who, who, whose families operate in these, uh, in these environments and to get a sense of the next gen perspective of this. Uh, and so we're gathering data from any potential source that we can as well as the literature, uh, which we are surveying uh, frequently. Just briefly in terms of the interviews, we've clustered them by geography, as we mentioned, and then we've got a whole bunch of countries that we've identified within each of those regional clusters. Um, there are still a couple of the interviews to continue to conduct, but by, by and large, we have a sense of, of where we're headed, and so we're, we're really getting excited about the survey design component of this. Um, and in the context of these interviews, as we gathered the data, it was clear that we had to refine our early hypotheses, and so this is how we did it. Uh, initially, when we were looking at emerging markets, we recognized that they're different, but we now have a much better sense of, of just why they're different, at least we think we do. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that we recognize is that a lack of trust appears to be the critical variable, an institutional trust, the critical variable which differentiates emerging from developed markets. It's captured very nicely by this quote in The Economist a number of years ago. The ubiquity of informal firms also points to a final lesson, the corrosive effects of a general lack of trust. Without enforceable laws, contracts, and public services, 
that make taxes seem worth paying and a political establishment that serves the natural interest, it's not extractive, it's inclusive, the only institution that most people can rely on is the family. That probably resonates with anybody who's ever lived or worked in these environments. Another great quote comes from uh, the Harvard historian David Landis in his book Dynasties, but uh, he says, uh, it sort of hints at the importance of families in these contexts in particular. The nations of the developing world, particularly those most desperate for economic development, urgently need family enterprise. Their cultural, political, and economic circumstances are not mature enough for ma managerial business structures. In these places, family firms are the best hope for successful development. Businesses in these regions need the trust and training that family makes possible. The, res the resources that family can mobilize and failure to understand that can be quite problematic. Now there's a bit of a sort of colonial uh, superiority baked into the way in which he's framing this. Uh, but you get a sense of, of, of a recognition that family can play a really powerful role and family firms can pay, play a really powerful role in these contexts. So as we began to gather additional data about institutional context, about institutional voids as we've come to understand them, um, we, we came across a project that's being run out of Harvard right now. And for those of you who are interested in emerging markets, I'd highly recommend visiting this microsite within the Harvard Business School. It's called the Creating Emerging Markets Initiative. It was run out of the business histories, uh, Center for Business History there. And basically what they did was they went and they interviewed a bunch of leaders of uh, large prominent families in the emerging markets. Uh, not family, sorry, large le uh, leaders of large uh, enterprises in the emerging markets, many of which are family controlled, but not all of them. And so that wasn't their angle. They seem to be agnostic to family, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But there are wonderful quotes that resonated completely with the experiences that we heard in our interviews and, and that we read through in our data set. You know, things like the gorillas killed several of our managers and took over our plants, and the military would walk into our plants to get gorilla fighters out. It was a terrible time. I mean, these are, these are leaders of the companies at the times in which these things are happening, and they're talking about the challenges and the opportunities of working in these markets. You know, the biggest challenge in Africa is that you constantly have to manage the regulatory agencies, or that you can't rely on counterparties to provide necessary capital at the right moment, or that the government tries to intervene at various times to try to stimulate and provoke your behavior. Uh, and so, you know, you get a sense of, of a very, very similar data set to the one that we were collecting, which we found quite encouraging. And then in the context of understanding and exploring that research, we came across the work uh, of, uh, the seminal work of Taran Khanna and Palepu, among others who have, over the series of, of, of research papers and, and, a, and a book that they published through uh, Harvard Business School, um, they really dove deeply into emerging markets and came up with frankly, a, a hypothesis that was, was quite similar to ours, and it had us worried at first. Um, you know, they talk about emerging markets being characterized by undeveloped, into underdeveloped institutions and frequent environmental shifts. They talk, they talk in this case about the number of interviews. They conducted 69 interviews, which are featured online. So you've got transcripts and videos, a public data set. In this case, ours uh, was a public data set, but our interviews are all private, and so we, we can't share any of that information. So already, here they are outpacing us in terms of their research design, and we were getting a little insecure about this. And, and they proposed reputation as a meta resource that allows firms to activate their conventional resources. And here we are thinking, okay, this is very similar to what we're talking about. We might find replaced reputation with family here, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But in general, they talk about building on research and strategy and business history. We thus shed light on an underappreciated strategic construct, reputation, in an under-theorized setting, emerging markets, over an unusual period, the historical long run. So outside of the focus on reputation, this sounded exactly like what we were trying to do. And so at first we thought that we got scooped. But in further reflection and reading through their papers, we, we recognized in fact that this was some validation for the approach that we were taking. And in particular, as we looked through it, every time I would read uh, through, the, through the paper and I would see the word reputation, the word family sprung into my mind. And frankly, when we looked at the research itself, we recognized that the use of the word family only existed once in, in at least this one 14,000 plus word paper. And it existed in a, in, a, in, a, in a way in which we wouldn't necessarily frame it, uh, which suggests that they're in general pretty agnostic, frankly, to, to the role that family can play in addressing this reputational void that they're talking about here and to inspire transactional confidence, which is ultimately what they were looking for. So, uh, so here we are at a, at a point in which we're recognizing that these institutional voids exist they are the one principal characteristic that differentiates a developed market from an emerging market. And that if we put this on a spectrum from stable developed economies 
to dysfunctional frontier economies over there in terms of the size of these voids. And when we talk about voids, we're really talking about uh, the lack of, of, uh, of, of trusted intermedi intermediaries in financial markets, a lack of uh, trusted analysts, impartial third-party advisors, and you know, for instance, we always we always use this, uh, the simple example that you know Uber and its rating system gives you some confidence in sitting into a in, in a car, getting into a car with a complete stranger, and driving from your home to some place that you want to be. And would you feel similarly comfortable hopping in a, a vehicle with an unknown third party in a country like you know sort of uh, Yemen right now, and uh, and going from the airport into the downtown core? It's you know, that most people would, would react and say, you know, no, if, if I know somebody and I'm going there for a reason, they're going to arrange for somebody to come pick me up at the airport and make sure they've got your name and make sure you know who they are and so forth. So that there are no intermediaries who are building trust between strangers in these societies and that in those contexts we, we end up falling back on our families. We end up falling back on familial connections and familial networks in a way that, that is quite profound. And so when we think about stable developed economies, the three circles interact in, in, in all the ways that we're familiar with, but as we move into these lower trust environments, we recognize that the family begins to project itself in very predictable ways into ownership decisions and into business-related decisions, such that when we get into these frontier environments where these voids are the greatest, uh, families really do drive a lot of the decision-making and familial networks drive a lot of the opportunity and the, a lot of the resilience that we see in the, in the organizations that have survived and thrived there. So what does that look like? Let's take a, a deep dive into this and explore the three circles in the context of the family circle sort of uh, expanding its influence uh, throughout the system. Uh, in terms of the family, so family values tend to anchor culture, strategy, and decision making, of course, that their views on security and risk shape organizational policies and protocols. Some families in Colombia that spend millions of dollars a year on security and private armored guards and so forth that shuttle the family back and forth. It shapes the way in which the business is run. It shapes and affects margins. It shapes and affects profitability. Uh, and, and the perception of partnership when others are coming into the business and you're bringing in joint venture partners and, and, and that their sense and what it signals to them about security. Concentration of wealth and power via marriage. You tend to have uh, clusters of, of, of uh, dynastic families pairing off in these environments. So that there's a really a small circle of control, a small circle of powerful families that in, intermarry so, and so forth, and they, and they end up managing and maintaining control in that way. And they tend to be very well educated, uh, often abroad, at least the ones that take education seriously, the ones in our data set, and that suggests that they're getting access to education uh, that, that others in their local uh, markets aren't necessarily getting access to. If you think about the business, we're talking about commitment to a family's reputation, enhances its focus on quality in general, particularly when the brand is a part of the name. We saw that in the last slide that was featured in uh, the Khan and Palepu research, uh, that family brands tend to be more trusted than governments and multinationals in these environments. There's a bunch of research that supports that as well. They tend to have a loyal and trustworthy labor pool, which is difficult to find in these markets, where labor markets themselves are very well uh, under, uh, underdeveloped. Uh, they tend to be safer and more reliable, uh, or they tend to consider it safer and more reliable to do business with relatives. And so if you have an opportunity to work with a third-party distributor, a supplier, um, and, and, they, and they're known by your family, or they, uh, the relationship between your family and their family goes back you know, uh, several decades, in some cases hundreds of years, uh, those relationships are much more trusted than some you know, third party uh, independent who's coming in. Even if they're a multinational, even if they offer a better price, it's the reliability and the security of knowing that that's a relational, uh, a, a relational effect rather than a transactional, transactional effect. It's, it's a very powerful motivator. There tends to be a strong commitment to local markets and communities, and that has all sorts of spillover uh, benefits uh, among stakeholders. And they also tend to build key infrastructure rather than wait for public investment in many times. So we've seen throughout our public data set as well as our interviews that many of these families are building roads and bridges and telecoms uh, infrastructure. They're building hospitals and schools. And they're, they're building it themselves because the government isn't doing it for them and for others. And so they, uh, they tend to take a very proactive role and not waiting for that to happen so that they can continue to grow their businesses. Uh, in terms of ownership, again, that, uh, that family and familial networks can provide an accessible and reliable uh, source of funding. So sometimes you know, it's family members that are co-funding each other's projects. Uh, and so you get groupos and groups of related family members who are cross-investing in, in, uh, in, in their various activities. They tend to have lobbying influence through political connections. Sometimes there's a family member in government and that tends to spill over and provide special access. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, geographic dispersion provides access to global advisors and partnerships and even capital. So when you send your kids abroad and they go to fancy private schools and they go to uh, the best Ivy League schools for their MBAs, they meet a bunch of people, 
uh, and that gives them access to deal flow, access to global insights that aren't available to local uh, uh, local companies who are who are more uh, insulated uh, to those to those effects. The uh, access to familial networks can provide um, opportunities in common cause, and of course, diversification of family wealth across multiple jurisdictions can curtail risk and actually allow people to take more risk in their home company. So building a nest egg outside of the really dangerous, scary, complex, volatile environment uh, can allow you to, in fact, counterintuitively take more risk in those risky environments. And then uh, you're not taking risk for the sake of risk. You're taking risk because with more risk comes often more reward. Um, and so having that nest egg outside and making sure there are family members who are squatting on that nest egg effectively uh, is, is supportive of the overall health of, and continuity of the enterprise. So that was our, uh, our sort of our take, our, our revised take on the institutional context. In terms of biological resilience, everybody still with me? We're good, I know it's a long session. It's a lot of content to digest. Do we need to stop and stretch for a bit? Yeah. Okay. Um, so biological resilience provides insights into organizational resilience. We said this, of course, before. Um, we did want to recognize that there has been pushback against the use of organizational paradigms for uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, biological paradigms for organizational purposes. And that, that criticism actually goes back several decades, 30 years in fact, uh, and Ruth Young and others have challenged the, the, the sort of the easy connections that we can make between nature and, and, and sort of uh, social systems. Uh, and so we're, we're cognizant of that, and yet uh, we have to imagine that there is something, surely we can learn something from how nature is solving ex existential crises on a regular basis over you know, billions of years. And, uh, and so uh, as we think about the, the common organizational paradigm in developed markets, it's about controlling the environment by creating predictable outcomes, strategies, all those, what's so process and, and, and governance architecture and so forth. All that structure is intended to create predictability and to make financing, lower the cost of financing and increase the, the sort of the returns on, on capital. But some environments aren't controllable and some outcomes aren't predictable and that's particularly true in the environments in which these, these families play. The ecological paradigm is the following, not to control the environment, but to, to, that certain structures and behaviors naturally evolve over time through the process of, of reinforcement and evolution uh, to, to insulate organisms against environmental shocks and chronic stressors while retaining their basic functioning. So the whole concept here is that over time, nature has found a way to evolve such that uh, it's able to continue to do what it's doing despite the fact that every so often, there are changes, massive changes in temperature, there are forest fires, there are invasive species that enter a local e ecology and so forth. And, and so the ecological paradigm is how do we create structures internal to the organism and, and into, uh, internal to the, the ecosystem itself and the way in which organisms interact with their environment that allow the entire system to remain healthy and vibrant over time. And so our extremos paradigm is trying to extend that same construct that there are certain structures and behaviors, for instance, redundancy, and we can talk about the biological version of that as well as the organizational version of that in a moment, that are chosen that help to insulate the family uh, and family enterprise systems against environmental shocks and chronic stressors while retaining their basic ability to function. It isn't just functioning, of course. The ones that we're really tracking are the ones that are functioning incredibly successfully in these environments, but you get the point we're trying to make here. So the question that we've been asking ourselves is how do business families create an island of s stability uh, and success within a, a sea of turbulence, ultimately. And what allows the best of these systems not only to survive, but actually to thrive? And so we'll come back to some of the insights. Basically what we've done is we've taken these five recurring archetypes in the data set that we saw initially, and we've begun to look at them through more of a biological lens. And we recognize that there are, there's all sorts of research on biological resilience, and it turns out there are clusters of, of coping mechanisms that nature has implemented that allow them that, that allow uh, organisms to, to survive in, in, in pretty toxic environments, in pretty complex environments. Our, our initial archetypes were what we thought to be mutually exclusive. So you pick one of these and you stick with it. Uh, you may shift over time. And as we understood, there are, of course, there are groupos and multiple holding companies. And you might have this strategy in one of them and this strategy in another. It got pretty complex. And we recognized that this was, this was uh, unnecessarily binding in terms of our understanding of the system. That uh, we thought that they were collectively exhaustive and that we also recognize that there was more of a business focus to the way in which these, these strategies, these archetypes were manifested. Instead, we've begun to think about this in terms of building blocks, coping mechanisms. So these building blocks of resilience. Uh, and they can either be sequential, you can start with one and then move into others, or they can be run in parallel. You can be using several of these simultaneously. 
Uh, but we think of them, again, as building blocks of resilience. Uh, and, and to the extent that organisms or organizations embrace these, it tends to increase their fitness in a complex uh, environment. And that they can be deployed not just within the business circle, but in fact that, that uh, the insights from this can, can be applicable across the three circles. No problem. Oh, we have a note. Professor Landsberg will be here at 11.45. <laughs> Do you mind if I read this? Could you please try to extend as long as possible? <laughs> okay. So hopefully I'm doing a good enough job of stalling here. Um, and uh, so what time is it now? We've got 15 minutes. That's not long at all. I actually have to rush. Um, okay. So, key question, how do these coping mechanisms build organizational resilience or compensate for a general lack of institutional trust? Well, let's talk about what the building blocks are. They're not just little icons. The icons, while well, it took us a while to find ones that seemed appropriate, that wasn't the point. The point was uh, that there are certain, certain structures, certain, uh, certain uh, evol evolutionary tendencies that we've seen manifested across organisms that, uh, that's, that suggested uh, uh, that suggested uh, applicability to organizational systems. And there are many that were not applicable at all, but there were some that were, and these are the ones that we focused on. Modularity was the first, the idea of amplifying the productivity of individual units when integrated into a broader network. You get a sense of that with, with the sort of your typical honeycomb. The hexagonal cells are both individually functional but collectively scalable. Um, adaptability is about repurpose, repurposing existing resources as circumstances change. There's great research on so-called ant rounders, uh, 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 all-rounder ant colonies. I don't know if you guys have heard of slave master ants. I had no idea that there was this much diversity uh, in, in the ant world. But in fact, when slave master ants go to invade uh, um, an ant nest, there are two types of, of, of responses. The all-rounder colonies are those where, uh, where individual ants can be repurposed to be workers or uh, protectors uh, and so forth. I'm not even sure if the, the queen is adaptable in that way as well. Uh, but specialist colonies don't allow for that. So they're much more productive, the specialist colonies. But at the moment when, uh, when threats emerge, that the all-rounders who are more adaptable, the workers can switch very quickly to become soldiers and defend against the, uh, uh, um, the slave master ants. And the, survivor, uh, the survival rate of those colonies is much higher, sort of statistically significantly higher in those circumstances. You get a sense of where we're going with this, right? Embeddedness is about coordinating actions and responses across uh, interdependent external systems, so there's all sorts of research on coyotes and badgers who are more likely to pair up in order to increase their, uh, their, uh, their uh, success rate at trapping ground squirrels. So the, the badgers will go underground and chase a squirrel out and then they'll pop up and then the coyote will get the, the squirrel and if they're able to ch or the, the, uh, the ground squirrels, if they're able to collect more of those and they end up sharing them in a way that is, this is sort of one of those uh, natural phenomena that makes you kind of wonder and, and smile in some respects that they're able to find that kind of collaboration cross species. Self-regulation is about managing anomalies without malfunction or collapse, right? And you get a sense of the, the, homeostatic, uh, the homeostatic system in our own bodies that does that very naturally. Redundancy is about supporting or replacing vital primary systems in emergency. Some of that comes from our, our uh, multiple organs that we have to do virtually the same thing. Uh, but uh, we also have multiple genes in the genome performing these, the same function in case one goes haywire, that the body can then tap the other one in order to promote healthy cell replication. And then diversity, the idea of developing a range of resources and capabilities to pr uh, pr um, protect, not product, against acute shocks. So the idea of, of uh, forests that have a greater variety of tree species tend to be resistant to all sorts of things from, uh, you know, sort of uh, the Asian longhorn beetles and so forth, things that tend to attack one particular species, uh, as well as forest fires and climate change. And so these were the, the of all of the uh, biological uh, forms of, of resilience that we, ident that we surveyed, these are the ones that seem most broadly applicable, and frankly, many of them connected to our, our initial archetypes. So it was quite reassuring that we'd seen these manifested in some ways in the systems that we were interviewing uh, and in, in the public data set that we had gathered. So this is how it might manifest itself. I'm not going to go through the whole chart, but let's just focus. We'll pick and choose. I highlighted a couple of them in bold, and we could talk about any of them. But in, in terms of embeddedness, Here's one. So in the business circle, this is, this is about coordinating with government or familial networks for protection, funding, access to deal flow, and so forth. Well, I'll share an example in just a moment, but you get a sense of how that might work in the context of, uh, of an enterprise. In terms of redundancy, you know, in ownership, developing offshore nest eggs to self-insure against loss and allow for greater risk-taking within the market. We just talked about that, but it's a great manifestation of 
of having duplicate capital that might not be productive, but it's being saved offshore in case all of this goes away. It's one of the things that the Balbaki family utilized so effectively that we talked about earlier in keeping some capital offshore in Beirut, and therefore they had some startup capital to begin their entrepreneurial activities when everything got taken away in Syria. And finally, self-regulation. We got wonderful anecdotes from throughout our research about legitimizing these idea of R&R breaks. So uh, it was a great, uh, great story out of Venezuela and, the, uh, and one of the uh, families that we interviewed there where, um, where, they, where they often go abroad. They'll go to Miami, they'll go to New York, they'll go to Europe. Uh, and just to get out of that, of that intense anxiety-provoking environment, the reality is sometimes when they come back home, it's also liberating. So there's a, a great story of one of the general managers of the companies uh, that we had talked to, and this was uh, his boss telling us about it. But when he drives, he goes to Germany, and there he had to uh, you know, obey all the signs, the street signs and the stop signs and the speed limits and so forth. And as soon as he gets back to Caracas, he's driving like a madman in the streets, and it's invigorating for him uh, because he's so accustomed to that environment. His, his risk tolerance is much higher. He's got thicker skin for this kind of stuff. And so uh, self-regulating, spending appropriately, uh, time uh, off, you know, sort of uh, on shore leave, so to speak, and then heading back to the front lines is, is pretty vital in these systems as well. So we're going to share a couple of, of actual examples from the research itself. Um, redundancy, here's one, uh, is use in family business systems. So several family businesses that we've talked to, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, given unreliable infrastructure uh, or unavailable pub public utilities will in fact build out their own infrastructure. It's a great uh, anecdote from one of the families in Haiti uh, that can't rely on, on public power grids for reliable power. They run uh, hotels, right? So you need constant power for your guests to make sure that they're safe. They're not getting trapped in elevators. They feel like they've chosen the right hotel uh, to stay in. Uh, and that they have to not only subscribe to single telecom operator, but to multiple telecom operators. They have multiple internet operators and service providers, so that if any one of them goes out at a given time, they've got redundant backup systems. Of course, that has a tremendous impact on margins, right? Because you're having two or three of everything. Not only do you have backup generators for your power, but you have backup generators for your backup generators and backup parts for the backup generators and all the backup fuel for all of those multiple generators. So it, it does put a lot of pressure on margins, but in that moment when power goes out, you know, you, you're glad that you've had it. It's a really uh, important insurance policy. You're sort of self-insuring. In terms of self-regulation, one of uh, the Colombian conglomerates that we interviewed uh, created an investment fund as a hedge against their internal business volatility. Uh, and then they keep the family united through a social dividend. So it has, it has purpose beyond just uh, providing a stable stream of, of liquidity to owners, but it also helps to keep them cohesive in, in the event that, that something uh, unfortunate were to happen to the, to the core operating business. And in terms of adaptability, here's an example from history. Um, the Brown Foreman, I'm not sure if you know who they are. They are um, the, the spirits uh, manufacturers. They make all sorts of bourbons and whiskeys and so forth. Um, and uh, they responded to prohibition by distributing medical alcohols. So they weren't allowed to sell alcohol for, for consumptions. They began to make medical alcohols. And they began to barrel all the drinking alcohol that they were manufacturing. So they could still make it legally, but they couldn't sell it. So they kept stockpiling it and stockpiling it and aging it. And then when Prohibition ended, they were selling special reserves that had been aged for certain numbers of years. And they'd maintained their, their operating capacity, uh, the same facilities, the same equipment, and the same talent throughout Prohibition, such that when, when circumstances changed, they were prepared. And many of the rest of their, uh, of their competitors went out of business. In fact, on their website, they, they, they brag a little bit that they are the only distillery that existed bef both before, during, and after Prohibition relative to all of their peers. So you get a sense of how this stuff might play out. You got a question? Absolutely. So, so the, the comment was made that in, the, in some of these markets, the, the, the sheer fact that they are so extreme and so complex and these, these challenges actually spur, they stimulate entrepreneurial activity. As they say, necessity is the mother yeah, of invention, right? I wish I could share this with you. There we go. Yeah. 
they created transportation companies in right. order to transport, I mean, what they have to sell right. and things like that. So uh, it's uh, on the contrary, I mean, it's stimulating those companies to create entrepreneurial ventures. Absolutely. and uh, They fill the voids, right? But of course, course right? out of they try to be resilient as much as possible. Absolutely. No, and I, I would love to, to the extent that you all have uh, anecdotes and cases that we can add into our understanding of this, especially ones that connect with it, but, but particularly ones that extend our understanding of it, we'll be happy for you guys to follow up and, and, and share some of the names of those families. Um, okay. Did I turn this off? Do it the old-fashioned way. Okay, so. Uh, a final comment to make here. Yvonne will be on site any moment. Um, it's not a final comment. We've got a couple of minutes of discussion here. But that co coping mechanisms, these coping mechanisms that we've identified aren't silver bullets, of course. It's not that doing these will preserve and, and, and protect the, the company against all forms of external stressors. And that if you use them uh, to great effect over time, at some point they go from ripe to rotten in terms of, uh, in terms of their, their utility. For instance, uh, if we look at the sort of one, one visualization of what a, a, an, um, a high volatility episode might look like. There's always some level of structural volatility in any environment. Uh, there's some contextual volatility in a particular region or so forth. But you know, at various times, for whatever reason, regime change, uh, some environmental shock, a political shock, an economic shock, something happens and we get up into this territory here. And you can picture this, you know, this, the time is, is sort of relative here, but this band in the middle here could last anywhere from three months to 30 years. And at some point, you could picture a, a strategy like embeddedness, for instance, and we've talked about this in the context of South Korea before. And the fact that in the, in the 1960s, it was a matter of public policy that, uh, that the Korean government wanted to sponsor and support uh, the, the family-run Chaebol. And, uh, and they, they was a, it was a matter of, of public policy. It was to protect them from external competition. It was to provide them with uh, access to, uh, to discounted financing. It was to provide them with access to key lucrative uh, 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 government contracts. Uh, and, and it was all done out in the open. It was a, it was a prescription for, for economic growth and it, it created what might be described as one of the, the most explosive periods of growth in, in sort of Asian, recent Asian economic history. Um, the challenge, of course, is that at some point, once that's run its course, and we're bumping into that now, the Chaebol are coming under attack from the public who feel that that protection is no longer warranted when you've got massive companies uh, who are, who are uh, competing unfairly against smaller entrepreneurial firms. You've got uh, the heirs to some of these empires engaging in some, uh, some pretty embarrassing behavior in public from, um, from you know, sort of berating somebody for serving nuts on the wrong kind of tray on an airplane that your parents own, uh, or to beating people up in bars and so forth, and, and then getting off without, uh, with just a slap on the wrist in many of these cases, that you're getting a lot of pushback. And so the embeddedness strategy that, that we talked about, the idea of being uh, uh, sort of nested within a protective uh, outer ecosystem and, and having the protection of the government that supports you can actually become a liability as, as these risky episodes wane and as you return to more of a normal, uh, a, a normal environment. And that's true across uh, several of the, of the building blocks that we've discussed. So I was hoping that Yvonne would be able to share this part with you, but he will, he will do so when he gets here, and I'm sure he will summarize it uh, even better than I am. But I'll get started with it. This is our attempt at, at synthesizing everything that we've just shared with you. The concept is that we've got a bunch of independent variables that we've talked about, some related to the business, some related to the ownership, some related to family, and, and some related to these, these building blocks that cut across all three. And so, you know, the ones that we've identified that we've talked about are, you know, for instance, around the business planning horizon. Are they planning in sort of three-month increments? Are they planning in three-year in three year increments? Uh, many of the companies that we talk to don't even have a strategic planning horizon. They say the long term is next month. And anything beyond next month is, you know, you might as well roll the dice and try to figure out what's happening. We can all try to, you know, place bets at what inflation will be and, you know, within a certain number of significant digits in a couple of months. But other than that, it's really about tactical triage on a daily basis. Leadership style, the uh, leadership session and the plans for leadership succession, the amount of leverage in the system, resource availability if they have access to the key resources they need to continue to operate. And then reputation, of course, you'd certainly want to take from, 
uh, from Kana and Palepu's research, that key component, because we understand the, the value of transactional confidence in these environments. We want to see if firms themselves are focusing on this and the ones that succeed and the ones that create the positive outcomes we're looking for are, are, um, are focused on this intent, uh, intentionally and so forth. So you go through go you know, key ownership characteristics around governance architecture. Do they have a board or not? If they have a board, what type? Do they have diversity on their board and so forth? Uh, shareholder development, are they investing in developing shareholders so that, when, uh, that will be responsible stewards of the enterprise over time? Do they have any liquidity planning in place and so forth? And all the way through to key family characteristics, drawing on some of the circumplex model here in terms of cohesion and flexibility. Are those characteristics uh, 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 at all correlated with the outcomes that we're looking for? Uh, lifestyle, territoriality, and even religion. When we talked about uh, the coping strategies, so that these ones cut across, not and not sure quite how to visualize this, but we felt this makes sense. Well, Tig, you can give us some, some feedback on whether or not we're doing this appropriately. Um, and then there are these intervening variables, of course, the institutional context, which moderates some of the effects uh, of these independent variables on the outcomes that we're looking for. And these are the outcomes, and we'd love to take your advice on this too. But of course, there are outcomes in terms of business health. So what of this is supportive of business health in terms of growth, in terms of margins, competitiveness, and their own internal expectations for the future? And one of the reasons why we're focusing on growth margins and so forth, rather sort of relative performance rather than absolute performance, is we suspect that in a broad global survey uh, that, f that families will be more inclined to provide that data uh, given their, their, uh, their tendencies toward confidentiality. And so we're, we're trying to design the survey in such a way that we can get at this, but it doesn't feel like they're giving away too much or exposing themselves uh, to the kind of transparency that they, that they uh, tend to react to. In terms of ownership health, again, return on equity and, and net worth. This might be a growth measure, or it could be an absolute measure, or it could just be within which bucket do you fall, and you don't have to give us a real number, but just give us a sense of whether or not these, the combination of factors that are present in your system are correlated with any particular scale or, or growth trajectory. And then in terms of family health as well, this isn't just about the family system, as Dita was reminding us, we've got to take a broader perspective of the entire system. We want to make sure that the family's outcomes are also being measured and, uh, and connected back to decisions that they've either made or, or conditions that are present at the beginning. And then ultimately, when we're thinking about resilience, one metric that felt easy enough to ask uh, and one that wouldn't be too controversial is just, you know, what year was the firm founded or acquired? and then measure that against where we are today and just figure out its, its longevity. How long has it been controlled by this one single family over time? And is there any correlation between all this stuff and the longest lived firms in the sample? So is there a difference between the first quartile firms on this, the ones that have lived hundreds of years and those that have only been around for 20 or 30? Some of that will be environmental context, but some of it might in fact be some of the decisions that they made uh, about the structure of their organization and so forth. Um, in terms of our next steps, so we're refining this hypothesis, the next step for us is really to translate that conceptual model. And I'll go back to it because I'd love some feedback and love some, some, some comments and some advice around this as well. Um, but we're going to try to translate that conceptual model now. We have a strong sense that all of these factors are important. We have a sense of how they all relate to one another, but we need to go test that in the world. Uh, and some of the questions that we have, you know, how, do you, how do you tease out you know, congruence within the family or communication within the family or collaboration. How do you measure that? How do we ask that question in a way that we can quantitatively measure and then connect that back to some of the inputs? Um, you know, obviously this stuff is going to be relatively easy, but, but there are questions about whether or not families will give it to us. And is that a flaw in the way in which we're designing this survey that we're, we're asking for things that, that families might not be inclined to give us? Uh, and then, you know, ultimately, are we, are we taking the right approach with asking for relative performance or should we, should we be bold? and ask for absolute performance here and see if we can create this sort of first major database on, on, uh, on uh, family firm performance in frontier and emerging markets that also is asking all this other stuff and can become a platform for the exploration of further research questions and that others can plug into and that we can keep live and active and develop over time. Um, let me pause there as I buy a little more time for Yvonne and see if there are any questions. I'm going to back it up to the previous slide because there's a lot to bite off and chew here. And any quick reactions either to this or more generally to, to everything we've presented? Of course. Ty, thank you very much. So throughout your presentation, the question that kept reoccurring to me was basically, what is your definition of resilience? And when I got to this slide, it, it kind of dawned on me that Excuse me. That you 
you're talking about resilience both as an outcome and as a characteristic. And in this case, resilience basically is measured by longevity or survivability. Right. And I, that was my, <clears throat> sorry, um, that was my first instinct was, yeah. what is the difference between resilience and survival? Right. And in this case, in, in what, what this model shows is there is no difference. Resilience is the outcome that you're looking at. In my mind, and I think the literature largely supports this, resilience is a characteristic that leads to survivability. Okay. Okay, so my, my question to you is, how, how do you kind of conceptually look at that characteristic of resilience versus an outcome of longevity, and is that really resilience or not? Right, great question, and, and helpful to have you challenge us on that, because this is sort of just-in-time delivery, that we're pulling this all together, it, knowing that this audience is going to help us sort of think through this. Um, when we think about characteristics of resilience, I think this is where our minds go. These are the building blocks of resilience within the organization, the decisions that they're making either uh, through chance or how they've evolved naturally, uh, unintentionally over time, uh, the paths that they've taken to buffet themselves against the storm, so to speak, and that the outcome then is really, is really if this is working, it should produce greater longevity in the, in the, in the sample set. We hope that the data uh, plays that out. So I would just say that top thing that says in enterprise, enterprise resilience, move it over there and move define it, it clearly. Yeah. And that's Beautiful. the development. Absolutely. Thank you, Ty. How, what, is it okay then to just leave this as longevity? We just, we don't have to categorize it as anything else? Okay, perfect. Yeah, Don. Being adaptive and self-regulative and, and those sort of things, would that also affect the characteristics over time, right? So you're going to yeah. measure the things in that first box today. Right. The assumption is those have been consistent over the 20, 30, 50 years. And right. I, I would suggest, boy, there's probably been a lot of changes in those key characteristics over time. Yeah. So you're, you're measuring the relationship between now and resilience, and, and maybe the characteristics 20 years ago are very different than it is today. Fair so, enough. So how are you grappling with this evolution? You know, these firms are obviously dynamic and resilient and change and flexible. Absolutely. Wouldn't those characteristics also be changing? And these characteristics are changing well, too over time, yes. right? So the idea that at some point, we talked about it yesterday, the longitudinal analysis could be, could be useful. It would be great to go back to the same groups that participate today and see how they evolve over time. And if they switch through these in predictable sequences, you know, if, if you start typically with, with redundancy because you need to and then you start to build out something, diversification doesn't happen up front. You don't start doing six things at once most times. You start with one thing and you, get, you build up enough capital that you can then expand into others. So is there a sequential this sort of trajectory through this that happens temporally that we can measure and, and manage. But let me pause quickly. I hope that got a little bit to the answer. And welcome Yvonne here to well, join thank us. Thank you. Time. Sorry. Uh, we got, we got uh, seriously delayed, let's put it that way, in Dallas because of bad weather. But I was very confident that my, my buddy here would do a, an even better job than I could have ever done. So uh, thank you for your patience, and please let me not interrupt. No, so. no, there's no interruption. This is all. It's funny that I came. To you came just to the right spot. We joked about that. We it. joked about him showing up just for this we part. Had, we had arranged that I would talk about this bit, but uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, just to respond to build on the comments about like the the sort of distinguishing between resilience and longevity, that longevity is a dependent variable and resilience is a more independent or at least intervening variable, then that means you would need to study companies that did not survive. Yeah. So, yeah, right. I think that would be important. The other comment that I wanted to make was, I, I think I'm kind of going beyond what you're looking at, which is unfair because I think it's a, ter it's a terrific presentation and it's fascinating. Um, what about the health of the larger the country or the community in which the business is embedded because right. at what point does it become the business's self-interest because it looks like all the outcome variables are on the company itself yeah. what's at what point does it become the self-interest of these thriving companies the status quo is in right. their in their vested interest are there other companies that are really sort of working on making the environment better like getting venezuela right. back up Running. Right. Or when they're building infrastructure, that's not just for their own private use. It, it can end up being used by others, absolutely. How, you know, any ideas about how, whether and how we could measure and track it? It seems like a, another one of these temporal issues where you could take a snapshot today and then see whether their activity five years from now is, is led to. But it also suggests that they need to be at least 
systemically important in a way. They have to have a scale that they could, they could move the dial on some of these things. And in fact, there, there are some really wonderful examples. For instance, in Venezuela right now, um, the Volmer family, uh, they, they're a big, uh, manuf you know, they manufactured rum and, um, and many others who have a deep footprint outside as well. There, you, you have this feeling that they are, there is this community of enterprising families that are just waiting for Venezuela someday to turn the corner. And as soon as they does, then it can, they can come back in and reinvest. I mean, it's, it's what the Cubans been waiting for for 40 years, right? right? So, uh, Can you hear me? No, okay. okay. As you were speaking about resilience, I, I thought of, in the family business literature, organizational level resilience and some work that um, around episodes of uh, who survives and who doesn't survive at the organizational level when there is a, the death of a founder, or uh, so an internal shock or right. an external shock. But on the other hand, um, when you talked about trust, I thought at the individual level about the research in fragile versus resistant. Uh, right. trust. And I didn't see you, you went in the kind of, you provided evolutionary um, theories or explanations rather than a social theory. And I right. thought that might be an area to kind of build on, right. that it's the, um, the development of, of resilient trust that so provides. The, the anti-fragile concept, the sort of Nassim Tlaib's work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the resilient right. trust would kind of, that we see within families would um, maybe provide an explanation. I'd like to point uh, made a little bit earlier that maybe it's what in these environments do family businesses that have a competitive advantage um, do they uh, would they w not want the environment to change right. because they have others uh, okay. right because it presents its own That's risk to them personally rather than systemically yeah thank absolutely you. thank you can you hear me yeah uh, thank you very much for your presentation and for sharing with all of us, your research, I think is uh, excellent. And just a couple of ideas, maybe just to share with you. Do you know STEP Project? STEP Project, more or less, is a quite a similar idea about to try to measure or understand the transgenerational entrepreneurship uh, perspective in family business, the longevity. And what I can see in this project, I belong to this project, I can see in this project is uh, we are talking about survival, we are talking about survivability, and for firms that maybe 100 years ago, and what we are interesting in your presentation at the beginning was the dynamic of family business to overcome particular political problem, a family problem, or whatever, uh, but at, at the end, you show this uh, uh, figure with the independent intervening and outcome variable that is more a cross-sectional, yes? It's a, not integrated. A yeah. Picture uh -huh. about, about the longevity, longevity or resilience. So I think there is a mismatch in my perspective. What, you, what did you sell at the beginning? This dynamic, how family business are able to overcome in particular mm -hmm. moment of time mm -hmm. and then this figure that is is very clear but is not capturing this process how firms survive across time right. because I, I just thinking about our family firms more than one he, one years ago was um, one uh, 100 years ago uh, there were different CEO different moment of time mm -hmm. I am talking about Argentinian right. yes uh, environment and and said, okay, uh, how each generation was able to overcome different political, economic, and social situation in Argentina was completely different. But if I send this questionnaire or survey yeah. to my godfather, that is a CEO now, he will tell me a different perspective than my grandfather or someone else. Right. I don't know, just, uh, One of the things that was so exciting about our, our initial case research in the public data set in our interviews was that we could dive into these longitudinal issues. How, how, how sequentially over time did, did a single family manage a variety of, of, of these external stressors, political, economic, social, and so forth, as well as all the changes and tumult within the family, for sure. Uh, the challenge for us at this point is how do we generalize? Is there something that we can generalize? And it's tough to generalize from a, from a single longitudinal case 
you know, something that, that can, help, can help us tease apart the connection between these two things in a way that, that somebody would actually fill out an answer in, a, in an amount of time. But if you have ideas on how we could ask for that. And, yeah, right. and, and I, actually, your, your question prompts a, a tired thought in my head. Um, but but it, I think you, you're putting your finger on something that is kind of inherent to the process of research in some fundamental way, which is the, the trade-off of internal and external validity, as it were. You know, if you, the more you try to pin things down, the less interesting they become in some ways, because you have to sacrifice the complexities that you're wrestling with in an effort to try and measure something that you can then try to replicate and, 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 and pursue more precisely. And, and that's been our struggle constantly because we've been immersed in all these interviews that have exposed us to precisely the full range of, of, of complexity that you're uh, suggesting that I'm sure Devin presented at the front end of this. But, but for this step, we want to also narrow it down enough so that we can actually uh, you know, track some things uh, in, a, in a more statistical way. Um, but that's the beauty of actually going at it from a multi-method perspective, and hopefully we can synthesize it all uh, going forward. There's a, a woman in the back who's been very persistent. Thank you. Uh, let me piggyback on your idea, because I think that maybe one thing that you can look at is the capability of the family firms have to reinvent themselves. And, and reinvent it doesn't really mean to only be able to kind of create new products and things like that, but h how do we look at who we are and how we relate to others in a different way? And I think that that you, could cap you might be able to capture with a scale uh, of you know, you can measure different types of reinvention, reinvention of products, like reinvention of how do you approach things, your governance, or things like that. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you. Just looking at the institutional context there, I was just wondering if you're considering uh, to include the informal institutions. I see formal institutions there, but it will be interesting to know the extent to in which informal institutions support or make up for those formal institutions to compensate these institu institutional voids. And maybe through that, uh, y through your qualitative studies, you could get nuances within and across your five clusters to see how right. they behave to be resilient and be able to, to survive. Right. So all these norms, these traditions, these are unwritten rules in informal mm -hmm. institutions which are carried generation to generation that make up for these um, institutional voids. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so, uh, to also talk about a conversation that three of us have had many times and to piggyback on some of the uh, issues about uh, the, the end outcome variable. Um, uh, the struggle to take an extraordinarily complex process and, and well done to something that is measurable and where data can be gathered and actually looked at is, is very real. But I think the points that people are making about, about your last box, about your final outcome variable are, are really core here. Because longevity, if that is the, uh, um, it, 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 it uh, suggests us that the unit of analysis has to be the firm. That it has, there has to be an, identi an, an identified organizational entity that can be with that starting right. point and ending point can be measured right. but in fact the whole process you're talking about is really about evolution right. and in fact the 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 concept of the outcome uh, that you really are care about is not necessarily longevity of an identifiable firm mm -hmm. begun in this year and still here but what it has evolved into as a result of its resiliency the, the, the most positive outcome for resiliency may in some cases not be longevity at all it may be transformation into, into new forms that would not be captured by a starting point, continuous point, but into how the structure itself has evolved, which means the unit of analysis can't be the firm. It has to be some other definition of the family's enterprise right. that is more, more, um, more complex and more, uh, more 
fluid, right. more plastic. The way it's asked can't be about when was the firm founded and, and, right. and, and taking so, the difference between that date and today. Yeah. And the longevity and then an evolutionary transformation need to be together in the final turquoise box, right. not, just, uh, not just continuity, that mm -hmm. would seem to me. So the end state matters, yeah. Dita wants to, yeah. I had a statement about the similar thought, but m we moved enterprise resilience to replace the coping strategy. Yeah. I think only resilience needs to, me resilience. to move, yeah. and enterprise actually moves with longevity. So it's longevity of what? It's not of a firm. We're not talking of a firm. We're talking about enterprise, and what does that mean? Is it that same family or that same gene pool of the family? Right is still doing some sort of an entrepreneurial venture because they're not in that industry they're probably not in that country or maybe they are um, so that would be one kind of deeper thinking as you start thinking so it it may be but it may be when did your family first ever launch right. a private enterprise right. or you know um, i was also thinking about the question about the health of the context of the country that might be more controllable if we use it as a control variable in a quantitative study. It's probably harder in a qualitative study on that one. Um, so, but I see multiple dissertations in there. I don't see one. <laughs> no. I, I am sorry. I don't see one research project and like you know one questionnaire coming out of all this but we did chat yesterday about this is a great kind of end point and then say these are a bunch of future research questions right. and then 50 people go and do 50 dissertations on this uh, because each one will need yeah. require coming up with a questionnaire right. Right. now i also thought maybe you guys have those connections with 500 families who may well be, uh, that's building on your 30, 40 years of work, mm -hmm. who may well be able to answer, you know, this is a 50 page questionnaire, bear with me as I go through mm -hmm. it, and it's possible. So, you know, it's, it's what's possible. So those were my... Thank you, dear. It's probably two books, Devin, it's not one. <laughs> if Vaughn is ready to write the second one. Every I time I say yes to a conference that Dita's at, I come up with a, with a writing assignment. I appreciate it, Dita. I just have a final thought, and I hate to follow Dita because she's so profound in her feedback, but this relates to the other gentleman's uh, comment, and I was noticing your independent variables seem to be disconnected, and so, meaning you've got kind of clear boxes and no real relationship mm. to each other, meaning the characteristics of the business to the ownership to the family. So I'm wondering, maybe, you know, maybe there's a box around all of those. Maybe that's right. bi-directional. And maybe right. that's a piece that kind of lays There's underneath. There's stuff happening this way. Yeah. There's a relationship there. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Two more. Okay. Con congratulations. Uh, really, it's a uh, very, very interesting um, research. And my comment deals with the coping strategy. Sure. And I have to say that I'm agronomist, and I have uh, worked uh, with uh, okay. Uh, uh, microorganisms and so and what I think that could be interesting to explore is the symbiosis symbiosis and uh, well you can um, uh, uh, read the definition but it deals with the relation between two different organisms that support each other right. in order to have a benefit and right. I don't see that uh, and really what I have seen in in, in, in different countries, in, in developing countries, is that this is a very, very useful strategy right. to try to have some kind of synergy between organisms. Right. We, I, I, that's a great point. What we're, where we've tried to have that be reflected is, is in embeddedness, and that you have a sense that there are, there are ecosystems within which you are operating and that collaboration between entities within that ecosystem can be self-reinforcing and can produce greater benefits for, for both collaborating parties. Um, 
but this, the coyotes and badgers as, a, as, a, as an example of that. But maybe symbiosis is a, is a, is a better descriptor and more accurate in terms, of, in terms of the biological literature, for sure. Uh, okay. and, and, the collab and the symbiosis can happen not just across firms, as it were, but, or families, but of also course. between government entities exactly. and churches and, you know, religious uh, organizations, and, and they sustain each other, for sure. No, that's, that's uh, you know, I mean, I, yes. <laughs> you yeah, know, okay. That's what I call it. You don't know how hard it's been to make choices to try and narrow it down, you know, so every time we sit, our heads go exactly in that direction. Yeah. So what, what, partly to resist the 50 dissertation temptation, <laughs> uh, and you know, and you see what we got here. I mean, it's still, uh, you know, hard to rope in, but absolutely wonderful points. Thank you. There's Thank a gentleman you very much. at the back, uh, please. We have to, Thank we you. probably have to wrap up. I, I don't know, I, this, this is great, but maybe my, mine is the 51st dissertation. Um, <laughs> You signed up for one, Albert. Well, yeah, I know. Um, but I'm thinking about in these contexts, the businesses that are really tiny. So you, you gave the example of the Syrian that went to Lebanon. Well, they could afford to do that. What about the ones that... So there's a resource and a power difference in what seems to be your sample. Right. But Again, you've got to put boundaries on your work. But I just, like, there's also the other families that, that stay and, because they can't, they have no choice. And right. that's, how right. much of this would apply would be really right. interesting, too. Thank you all. That's it on time. At one yeah, we, we're gonna hit in the boundary, and I don't, I don't want my late entry to extend the <laughs> thing beyond what it needs to go, so. If there's one more question, we can take it. Otherwise, thank you all very much for your attention and thank your you. feedback. <laughs> you made it. Okay. So, thank you both for your conference on behalf of Universidad Panamericana and FERC, Fernanda Canale would like to present to you a token of our appreciation and thank you again. Okay, so it's time for lunch now. So let's go downstairs where it will be served. And poster session two will start at 1.15. So presenters, make sure that um, five minutes before you're setting your posters. Um, we'll be uh, visiting the town of Tequila, and we'll be leaving uh, from the main entrance of the university at 3 o'clock. So please be there five minutes before so we can get on the buses and beat traffic. Um, we'll have a tour of te the Tequila factory, um, and you will have some time to do some shopping and sightseeing. And we'll have dinner at 6.30, and we'll be coming back at 7.30 from there. Uh, so you can be here around um, 9 at the hotel. And tomorrow we'll start activities at 8 a.m. Uh, with FERC Spanish, Claudio, and uh, the FERC Spanish speaking group. And for the rest of us, we'll be having breakfast. It will be served at 8 o'clock. Uh, and the second conference will be at 9.30. Thank you.